pretty sure we have an awesome message that is prepared already. And I want my heart to be open. And I, I hope you guys feel the same way. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our hearts. Open up our ears. Open up our minds. Help us be transformed in your light. In your goodness. In your grace. In your ways, Lord. Let us be flooded in your way. Where we can be flooded at our workplace, at our home, with our friends, our family, complete strangers. So they can feel the love that you have given to us. Empower us with the Spirit, Lord. Your Holy Spirit. And help us give you all the glory and all the praise. Amen.
for our offering which is part of our worship a little bit that we give back to God of what he's given to us in his glory and his grace and as we give Lord it may not be here in the congregation as we used to do it but we still do it all week long every week every month we love you Lord and as part of our worship we give you this and Lord right now we'd like to pray that you would take this, our little offerings that we give you and make great use of those, that people could get saved, that people could get helped, that our church would go on as you've planned it, Lord. That the leaders, that you would impress on them what you would have them do to make the right decisions with these monies and these funds, that, Lord, for your glory and your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
see it. Morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. All right, uh, we have some announcements. Man, that, those songs, perfect. Right. Thank you, worship team. So we get this situated. Uh, okay, if you're a guest, we're glad you're here. Uh, you guys have been going through some things. I know a lot of you. I'm glad you made it here. What a victory. What a victory. So congratulate yourselves. Can we just do that this morning? Uh, and I'm just so proud of the people who have been consistent with, with the marriage course and just so grateful for that. Uh, we're going into week eight. Last week, this week, it's been good. Such good content. Such good content. So please be here for that. Uh, so I just have a few announcements. We have a cleaning day. We haven't had one of those forever. And I hope you guys show up. But we're going to have a cleaning day. Saturday, March 12th from 9 to noon. That's Saturday, March 12th from 9 to noon. Okay, wait, I got to back up. Hey, guys, everybody, this is the part where we pay attention because we're making announcements. Okay, I'm going to give you a chance to brain state the change. <laughs> How many of you are thinking about a million other things right now? I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay, if one of you is honest, thank you, Nate. <laughs> cleaning day. I haven't done that forever, so we're going to do some cleaning. Uh, they're really helpful. Uh, guys, this is not my building. Some, you know, some people pull up, especially little kids, they pull up and they say, hey, are, are you the uh, owner here? Is this your church? And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not how it works. Guys, this, this is our property, okay? You own this property. God has given it to you and to me to steward. So I want you to take ownership of that. If, if you see something that needs to be improved, like it's yours. So we can all do that together. Now, March 23rd, we want to have a, you're not ready for this, family meal. Meal. I said meal. Not just meeting. I said family meal slash meeting. What does that tell you? We're, we're like, we haven't done that since COVID lockdown. You know that? Like the family meal part? So, we're going to have a family meal. And here's what we need help with. Uh, it's a potluck, so of course we need help bringing amazing food, but also the setup and the teardown would be most appreciated. That's March 23rd. That's coming up here really quickly. Then uh, we're going to have our Good Friday meal. So we're going to have the family meal downstairs. We're going to have the Good Friday meal upstairs, okay? And we're going to celebrate the crucifixion because I'm grateful the Lord was willing to do that, to excruci uh, the excruciating betrayal and agony so that my sins could be paid, so I can be back in relationship with God. Really grateful for that. So Good Friday, that's April 15th, and again, um, we need help with setup and teardown, and if there's anybody who's interested in being a coordinator for that, and that can include the men. If you, want, if you say, hey, I want to step up and lead the men to, to set up and tear down, don't think you're too new here to, to take charge, okay? We're looking for help with that. Uh, worship team. Worship team. I'm talking to you now. You know who you are. <laughs> We're having, we don't have a worship team meeting this Thursday. Okay? Worship team meeting this Thursday. Including people who want to get back on it. Anybody? If, if, yeah. Mary, it was amazing. You really helped me this morning. The way you, because Cliff stepped back and then you stepped up. And I was able to sing as a result. So thank you. Well done. Worship team meeting this Thursday. All right. Those are the many, many announcements. Oh, and by the way, there's a special event for GNL tonight. Uh, so we got to make sure we get those kids picked up on time because we can't be late. Yes. Oh, the worship team knows. <laughs> Sorry, Katie, I don't know. We go way back. She just brings out the zaniness of me. Seven. Seven o'clock. <laughs> You're paying attention, and I appreciate that. Carla. We're doing Q&A time now. 
Yeah, we're doing a Good Friday meal. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is a seven. Well, see, you so, man, I'm, people are paying attention. I got to start giving more details. I usually give the details, well, yeah. Seven o'clock, Friday, April 15th, Good Friday, seven o'clock, potluck up, upstairs. Anybody else? All right. Roxanne, good to see you. All right. Mm. Want to continue on? I, I said I, I want to extrapolate much of the information from um, the Meaning of Marriage book. The Meaning of Marriage, uh, which was based on a series of sermons that was done in 1991. I first encountered the information in 2009. One of the reasons I'm doing this uh, is because I want this this understanding more fully downloaded to my my permanent hard drive so that I I use this on a more regular basis. So it's an opportunity for me. Gottman is given, as I said last week, given the practicality. And it's so real. This has given us the theology and the philosophy behind marriage. So here's the thing about marriage. Marriage is one of two divine institutions created by God. That is marriage. That is the church. He's the designer. It's meant to work, function a certain way. If it doesn't, if it's not functioning that way, it's not going to, nine times out of ten, it's, it's, marriage can be a nightmare. It, it, it really can. It, can. it can be something you want to escape from. And if you've been married for any point in time, I'm assuming you know that. But here's the thing. For everybody who's not married, and, and before you check out, here's the thing. Our, our mortal marriage is a reflection of the ultimate marriage, of which I hope you're a part. That is Jesus and his bride. So my relationship, my marriage to my wife is, is a reflection, illustration, analogy of the real, the ultimate. Okay? So we are to be, these principles we're called to, we're supposed to be living out anyway. So they're relevant whether you're in an earthly marriage or a heavenly marriage to Jesus. So don't check out. So here's, here's a quick review from last week. Here's the thing. A few things from last week. Broken people are inherently self-absorbed, self-centered. Now, a lot of times, it, it, the reason for that is because they've had to be, because they've been in survival mode, and no one else was looking out for them, so they had to look out for, out for themselves. That, that became hardwired. But that's really helpful to, by way of observation. Now, we, what happens when you bring that self-centeredness into a marriage? We'll talk more about that later. Now, we often respond to self-centeredness, respond to the self-centeredness of our partner with our own self-centeredness. Why? Self-centeredness, by its very uh, character, makes you blind to your own while being hypersensitive, offended, and angered by that of the other. Isn't that, that's not a good recipe. So often we respond to self-centeredness with, with our own. But yet we see how, how clear, and this reminds us of Matthew 7, where Jesus says, you know, take the, the log out of your own eye before you try to take a splinter out of your spouse's eye. So one way, so that's what we said last week. Uh, Ephesians 5.21 starts off this, this paragraph, the most lengthy paragraph on marriage that we have in our Bible. And it starts it off by saying, submit to one another out of your reverence for Christ. That right there just, just shapes and changes our definition of what marriage is. Because the world would say marriage is primarily about what I get out of it. That is telling us Right on the front end, marriage is about what you can put into it. We spoke about that last week. As we will see, marriage is meant, is meant to reveal how self-centered you are. That's on purpose. So we shouldn't be surprised. You know, it's like God in his design built into our life this... First, he calls us to get married, and then, then having children. And it's like, can you see how that would be character development? <laughs> so it, a lot of times people have a different view 
may have a more unconditional love for their ch- child than they do for their spouse. When it comes to their spouse, it's like, what, what are they providing for me? Versus the, the child, it's like, it's unconditional. Because it has to be unconditional, doesn't it? Because the kid, is, the baby, the infant, the newborn, is completely needy 24-7. And it's, yeah, it's providing, I mean, there's the thrill of, okay, I'm a parent. That's amazing and magical. But when it perpetually keeps you up all night long, I think the mag- you get past the magic, right? And you're just serving, 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 serving. It's all about what you put into it for a long time. So the call to submit to one another is a call, as we said last week, out of our brokenness. Because it's saying, see, we, 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 gotta, we need healing from the past, but we have to have a vision for the future. And that's what this text is providing for us. It's saying, look at if, if broken people, and we're all broken, are inherently self, the more broken you are, the more self-absorbed you're going to be, it's like he's calling us out of that to now replace something with something else. Replace our self-centeredness with selflessness. That, so one way I look at this text is he's calling us out of our brokenness into healing. It's a, it's a new way of living. It's a new value system. So and as we're going to see, he calls us out of a place where we can learn what love actually is. And this we cannot learn if we see our spouse or any other person as the ultimate source of our being loved and our soul being filled. No one can be God for us except God himself. That was one of the other points, from, last point from last week. So it, it's really important, <clears throat> and we, we pulled that, extracted that from Ephesians 1, Paul's prayer, Ephesians 3, Paul's prayer, but then even in the immediate context where it says you're to submit one another out of reverence for Christ, out of fear, the word is fear in the original language, fear of Christ, it's the idea of wonder and marvel. It's the idea of our soul being filled up in his love, which is what we're designed for, so that we have love to give to everybody else. But if you're looking to your wife your, or spouse to be the ultimate source of your love, what happens when they withhold affection? It'll wreck your world in that moment. Or it can't. It has the possibility of doing so. The younger you are, the more newly married, probably the more possibility of that. Uh, hopefully we grow and develop. And that's what marriage is called us to do. So now I want to transition to this idea of the purpose of the marriage covenant. The marriage covenant. <clears throat> You may not have realized this. Like, why can't we just say, why do we do this wedding thing? Why do we commit? Why do we put rings on the fingers? And we first make, in a, in a, a wedding ceremony, we make first a vow to God, and then we make a vow to each other. Why do we go through this process? And then even our law backs that up because it says, you know, we're, we're not, it's not easy to get out of a marriage. <clears throat> in fact, getting out of a marriage, for instance, one consequence, it'll affect you financially greatly. I had a lot of friends growing up uh, in my t- early, you know, young adulthood. They say, you know, I'm not getting married because, you know, it'll affect my finances. There's, it'll affect my taxes. There's all kinds of reasons. It'll affect my, my government resources. It'll affect... <clears throat> but if you look it up, it's actually, there's, there's many benefits for being married, including f- financial benefits. So there's, there's all kinds of benefits built in. <clears throat> but, so, but beyond that, why do we do it? It's an institution that God designed, and I, I want us to think even more deeply about the why, because if you understand the why and the what, the purpose, it's going to help. You need to align your view of marriage with the purpose for which it was designed. Okay? So the, the example the book gives is, you know, if someone designs and builds a car a gas, with a gas combustion engine, it's designed to receive gasoline at $4 a gallon right now, right? It's not designed, as he says, to, to be used, to be filled up with Hershey syrup. Okay, that's a simple illustration, but it's true with marriage. Like, you have to, you want to follow the guidelines of the designer because the designer knows how, knows how it works. So that is why, <clears throat> now looking at a covenant, we understand, like, okay, God designed us to have, make a covenant for specific purposes. What are those purposes? That's what I want to highlight today. Now, Where is the covenant, the marriage covenant in this text? Well, it's actually towards the end of the passage where 
Paul quotes Genesis 2, 24. So in Ephesians 5, 31, he says this, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to, <laughs> is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. So this is the verse where in the King James, in the Genesis 2, 24, it's where we get the idea of leave and cleave leave and cleave. So it says, a man leaves his father and mother. That is to say, essentially, what is being said there? The marriage becomes the priority. If, if, if the mom, mother and father were the, the most uh, intimate relationship we had, the most important relationship we had, now it's saying you're going to make the marriage even more important. So you're cutting ties to elevate the marriage. Now, if it's true for mom and dad, it's got to be true for everybody else as well. So it's really important if you want your marriage to function that you, you, the mar- your spouse has to be priority. Absolutely. Absolutely. It will not function. It will not be a pleasant experience if you do otherwise. And we're going to say, talk more about that in weeks ahead. But then the word, uh, as, as the King James says from Genesis 2, is cleave. That's a covenant word. So that you, you come together and you become one. So... God looks at a creation, everything's good, except for the fact that Adam is alone. It's not good. And so he, from Adam, he, he forms Eve, and the two become one flesh. So you're not one flesh with anybody else. A lot of people live like they're one flesh, and they do acts that, that cause them to to be one flesh, and then without the covenant, oftentimes it gets ripped apart, and that's why it's so excruciating, I often say, is because you, it, it's, you've been living as one flesh, but in a dangerous situation, and then eventually with one leaves, it's ripped apart, and that is excruciatingly painful. So it's so such that the pain lasts at least half as time as you were together, is the statistic that's often given. So there's the covenant language. Now, I've heard this before. Maybe you've heard this. The book highlights this. The idea of, I don't need a piece of paper to love someone. You heard of that? I had, there was a young man who was dating one of my, my family members, and he made this, this case. I don't need a piece of paper to love my family member. I was taken aback. He just, just, he was that bold about it. Now, what happens? Are they still together? No, they're not. He illustrated the reality of why we actually do need the piece of paper, as it were, which is such a reduction way to describe it. But it is a piece of paper in some sense, but it's so much more than that. It's a vow. It's a covenant. So when someone says that, it it, it can be coming from multiple places. Here's a couple options. I I don't love you enough to cut myself off from all the other options. Love shouldn't be forced, but should be free. I'm afraid you'll find out about the worst parts of me, and then you'll reject me. Love requires emotional desire and passion, and if you really knew me, you wouldn't desire me. So I must be free to leave. There are parts of me I already know that you will reject. Can you see the thinking there? Now, it is, that being said, it is possible to enter into, and I think we, we, we all start out this way, to enter into marriage with your armor still on. The question is, how long are you going to keep it on? And that's important, and we're going to come back to that. Really important with reference to the po- whole point of marriage. But here's the idea. I am most free, from the book, when I am most free when I vow, when I promise, because it allows me to demonstrate that I am not bound by my conditioning, by my genetics, by my childhood, by my emotions. I am not ruled by instinct or fate. I am free to create my own destiny. So, do you see that I am most free because I'm not bound by something else. I'm making the decision. It's, it's not just a cause and effect relationship where I say, I feel a certain kind of way, and as a result of my emotions, I'm going to distance myself from you. I, I personally do not want to be ruled by my emotions. That's something I'm continually working on and, even, and have room to improve. I don't want to be ruled by, and I want to pay attention to my emotions, and I want to feel my feelings, but I don't want to be ruled by them, but I want them to be signal to me, hey, what's going on with my soul? But then those emotions need to be brought to bear underneath God's rule. 
Otherwise, people are going to get hurt. I'm going to damage people. So that's, that's really helpful to know. So the idea of being free. I, so right there, what we're saying is marriage in God's design is not setting you up to oppress you. It's actually setting you up to be able to act, experience the most freedom. We'll come back to that. So he, here, here's this purpose for marriage. I want you to see this causal chain, this sequence, okay? Here's what's happening and why we make a vow. Please understand, this is critical. We make this vow. Well, first off, let me back up. Our, we, as we said last week, our, our relationship starts off as fantasy. What we call oftentimes infatuation, right? This person is so magical and makes me feel magical. That's how we start off. That's good. I'm not saying that's wrong. Like, like th- that needs to happen. There needs to be attraction. I think that's critical. I mean, but it isn't, that doesn't, I mean, you get married, and then you live with them, and you wake up to them, and they, what's going to happen? They're going to see the worst parts of you, and you're going to see the worst parts of them. That is by design. It shouldn't take us by surprise. We don't really know each other. We don't know the people we will become. But in spite of the storms life will throw at us, my vow creates something. My covenant creates something with this person. It creates a place of safety, stability, and security. You ever been in a long-term dating relationship and it's like you got to continually, I felt this pressure in the past where where I'm from, is the idea of I got to continually impress this girl or she's going to leave me. That will wear you out. It's like, okay, I got to take her. Is that me? I got to take her to the coolest places and the coolest parties and buy her the nicest gifts. Otherwise, she's going to reject me and she'll find someone else who will. The, the vow is not like that. The covenants are like that. It's like it creates a place of safety, security, and stability because the person is saying, you know what? No matter how I feel or whatever happens, not just now because now we're all good, but in the future, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You can kind of relax and breathe. So that, the vow sets up the safety, security, and stability, but that's not an end in and of itself. It's a, it's a great result, but, it, but the design goes further. The stability and security, the safety, serve a greater purpose. Can you guess what the purpose is? They create an environment, an environment where, in which I can be vulnerable. I can actually learn to take my armor off. Now, why would that be so? The vulnerability creates a place where I can be truly known truly known. Because this person, if they won't reject me, they're going to stay with me. Even when they see the worst parts of me, they're going to end up knowing me like no one else has. That includes the good, the bad, the ugly. They're going to see me naked for crying out loud. Okay? Like, that's some intimacy. That's some vulnerability. But yet, if simultaneously they don't reject me, they stay with me, I will end up being known like I never have before. What is, the, what is the result of that? What are we talking about? We're talking about what love actually is. That person, so what is the vow doing, the covenant doing? It's setting me up to be loved in a way I never have before. To experience love. Because before, like if you're talking about my story, I had to impress the person. Impress, impress, impress. Spend money, adventures, uh, entertain with the fear of rejection. But now, I have a per- and I couldn't show the worst parts of me, and there were certain topics that were, I, I could never talk about, right? Because that, that's awkward. That's inappropriate. I don't want to hear that. Now, but in a marriage, you're, you, we need to be sharing all the parts of ourselves with each other because as a result, we experience love. So we define love as to be seen, to be known, to be understood. And if, if someone fully sees us, fully knows us, fully understands us, it, we experience a love that is healing. Now, God is setting this, this environment up for us to experience this healing, but do you know that we can enter a marriage and still keep the armor on indefinitely? 
And I think sometimes here's how it happens, maybe indirectly. We say, because, you know, Gottman talks about the idea of building the love maps. We really need to know our spouse and spend time perpetually and continually staying up to speed with where our spouse is at now, to know them, how they feel about certain things. But oftentimes what, hap- what can happen in a marriage is we spend all that time during the, the dating part, and then after the dating, we're like, done with that. Now we just get into the rut. But people are continually changing because of what the, the, the circumstances of life. And, you know, and I, I've, I've found it to be true that uh, I've found that there's a lot of things that maybe a married couple has been married for maybe a certain amount of time, maybe a year, maybe five years, maybe 10. They, they don't even know about each other. They've never thought to ask. Okay, so just a quick aside, example, like Gottman is saying, hey, spend the time for those unsolvable problems, spend the time finding out why they have this strong position that they won't budge on. That seems obvious. Now, Gottman's going to say, it's because they have a dream for what their life's going to be like and their dream for the future, and you're coming straight up against that. And so you're, you're directly attacking their values, and you may not even realize it, but oftentimes we just, if we, we are in a marriage and it's just about being self-centered, then it's like as soon as they resist us, we're just mad and we get emotional. But if we can maintain like, okay, I don't have to, I'm, I'm getting my love tank filled with, with God so that if they lash out at me and attack me, I don't have to get emotional. I can stay rational. I, I, well, I can intentionally love this person and I can use this, maybe not in the moment because they're too emotional and they're flooded, but... I can use this as a catalyst to go back then and ask questions to get to know them. Why do you feel this way? You know, I've noticed you're so strong in this position. Why is it you take that position? I just want to understand you. And and you're not putting them on the defensive. You're not attacking them. And they're like, wow, no one's ever really asked me that. And I, I haven't really asked myself that. And so that person has an, experience, an opportunity to be fully known. And, and what, what, what is the result for you if you will go back and do that? You have an opportunity to feel not, not like disgust and contempt for your spouse, not, not like irritation and frustration. You have an opportunity to feel compassion. Because every time we, we will take the time to explore, every time, let's say 99.9%, you'll take the time to explore where someone's coming from, even though you may completely disagree and this just like boggles your mind. You think, oh, that's so stupid. What is the matter with you? If we'll take the time to explore their position, more often than not, we're going to feel compassion for them. Don't you want to feel compassion for your spouse? It takes time to explore that. And a lot of times, even in a marriage, as I say, a person won't share certain things because it says they're still afraid of rejection. That ought not to be. Now, I said all that, that the, the covenant, the vow is the catalyst. It forms the environment and the context through which we can experience love. Like real love, not the superficial, just, you know, fly-by-night, emotional, infatuated, like real love. But, But all that serves another purpose as well, a greater purpose as well. To, To illustrate for us the kind of love God has for us that we're his bride, that he knows all the worst parts about us, even more than our spouse knows, and yet he fully embraces us, refuses to reject us, and he says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'm with you even to the end of the age. So, so the marriage is to illustrate the stability that we have in Christ. Like, we, we wake up, we have a bad day, does God say to us, oh, you're going to hell now, you better get that right before you die. I don't find that in Scripture. Hmm. God is showing us how he loves us he gives he gives us marriage as an illustration can we make that connection to be lived out over a lifetime to give us this glimmer of his deep love for us and that's why our mortal marriage as we said is an example of of the marriage of Christ to his church and not the other way around. But yet, it's still possible that in a marriage, a marriage can like kill us, kill our soul in some ways. And we experience this from time to time. Because marriage can be like what I describe as the death by a thousand cuts. It can be excruciating pain 
in the way I look at it, what it can be is like this, this mild rejection over time when our sp- spouse fails to give the, um, themselves fully to us. To, fails to f- fully let themselves be known. That's painful. To be in a relationship where, where the armor's still on. You're not, you're not allowed full access And in a marriage, you can also be imprisoned, imprisoned in a marriage while your spouse fails to keep your vow, fails to cherish you. Now, one of the ways we describe, define cherish in recent past is the idea of cherishing is saying, I'm choosing to focus on all the positive things about you, and I'm going to overlook all the negative things. I'm going to I choose to focus on all the things I love about you, all the things that are wonderful, and, and all the, I'm not going to just ruminate on all your selfishness that I've encountered and, so that I build up this, this level of contempt and disgust that overflows into our day-to-day reactions so we end up fighting for no good reason. No, I'm going to cherish you. Love covers a multitude of sins. I'm going to live that out. So in a marriage, it's possible that we can be much more lonely than being single. Because the loneliness ends up being attached to a rejection. Rejection that's executed through a perpetual selfishness. And if we respond to the selfishness with our own selfishness, it's just a downward spiral. So the love that should be transformatively yours is within sight. It's within your grasp, but still feels like a million miles away. You're looking out. Here's how way I describe it. You're looking out this prison window to the view of paradise in the heavenly city. The vow was made. I am the one who's, who will be there for you. I will be there and I will be there for you in the future. Mark it down. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be there for you 100%. But they might have said, I'm the one who will fail to let love make me loving. And when we keep the armor on, we're failing to let love make us loving. And our spouse is going to take the hit. And I'm saying that to myself. So the vow of the covenant was meant to shape our identity into an identity of love. But it was forsaken for, and it can be uh, replaced with this uh, alternative uh, bargain idea. Covenant, what's the antithesis? The bargain. I scratch my, uh, your back, you scratch my back. And if you stop scratching my back, I stop scratching yours. And I withhold affection and I punish you till you get back on track and start providing what I need. That's the alternative. The bargain of what you can do for me. And I grant myself permission to stay self-centered, self-absorbed. The vow is meant to shape our identity, however, by keeping our promise despite all obstacles. So where in Ephesians 5 are all the exception clauses? So, and by the way... Love primarily understood, and we'll have to spend a lot of time here, as what you can do for me ends up being something like codependency or enablement. And you can think about why that might be true. <clears throat> what we love here is not, in, in a situation like that, it's not so much the other person, so much as what we love is what the person provides for us. We like the esteem they give us, and we like the affection they give us. Is that love, or is that selfishness? You answer the question. Now, the best marriages are reciprocal, aren't they? But it can't be, that can't be the basis. Like, we want to get there where we actually do scratch each other's backs. But not because it's conditional. And by the way, side note, quickly, are there grounds for divorce in the Bible? And if so, where are they? So first thing I think about is Yahweh himself, the Lord, The Almighty in the Old Testament uses divorce language with reference to Israel. Jeremiah 3, verse 8 would be an example. It's really interesting to read that context there. But in the New Testament, Jesus says in Matthew 19, 9, And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery, unless his wife has been unfaithful. So there's a condition. Adultery. 1 Corinthians 7.15, Paul gives us another one. But if the husband or wife who, who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the Christian husband or wife is no longer bound to the other. For God has called you to live in peace. 
I wonder if we could just kind of elaborate that, amplified Bible style, and say God has called you to live in peace, meaning uh, he's not called you to live in an abusive relationship perpetually and suffer pain and agony for the rest of your life. But you see, the idea of no longer bound. So that, the way we describe that, the category we use is abandonment. Now, I think it's possible for someone to abandon you even though they're still living at the same address. So I say this. Someone could come back and say this. Some might conclude here that if you divorce the person, even on biblical grounds, then the love you had wasn't unconditional. Which means you probably love your kids more than your spouse. And I say here, from my understanding, I say it's not so much that the person didn't love their spouse who they ended up divorcing, so much as that their spouse, in failing to keep their part of the covenant, cut themselves off from being loved. Cut themselves off from the, the transformative process that is built and designed and embedded in deeply in the very institution because it comes from God, who is love. Okay? So I, I, we want to have a holistic analysis of certain situations. Now here's the other thing about marriage. We're talking about the purpose of it. So I, I'm saying, I'm basically arguing point one is marriage will bring you to the place where you can feel love like no other context because they see the worst parts of you. They see your shame. And yet, instead of in the past where you experience shame, you simultaneously experience embrace. That will that will rock your world. When my wife does this to me, when I know I've been a bad boy, as it were, like I haven't been very affectionate, and I've been a little harsh with her, or uh, short with her, <clears throat> and yet she looks at me and sees, oh, Timothy's struggling. You know what? My world's going to stop. I'm going to be there for him right now. So I was kind of taking out my frustration on her, kind of jabbing at her a little bit. How much will she take, huh? How much does she love me? Does she love me enough to let me do this? But when she embraces me in those moments, it, it, it just, it's, it rocks my world. What else can I say? I feel deeply loved in those moments. Now we could say further, hey, should we continue in sin, Timothy, that grace may abound? That you feel deeper love from your wife? No, 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 don't do that. That's a bad idea. That's not loving. Here's the, here's the second purpose we we're going to point out. Marriage will reveal your true character like nothing else will. Marriage is going to reveal your true character. Now, what do you do during the whole dating relationship? You put your base, best face on. You want to impress the person, right? Don't you dress up for dates? Don't you take a shower before you go on the date? Right? Don't you get that haircut, hair done? Don't you get the perfume, the cologne? You shave, right? You do all that stuff. But yet, when you get married, your spouse is going to see you wake up in the morning. Right? Before you have a chance to do your makeup, perhaps. Okay. Just an illustration. Marriage is going to reveal our true character. So our feelings cannot tell us who we are, ultimately. Our achievements can't tell us who we are, completely. Our visions of our ideal self cannot tell us who we are. Feelings fade. Achievements are, are, are only but an incomplete expression of our character. And our best visions are only what we want to be. So nothing, will argue, reveals us like suffering and our response to it. Will there be suffering in marriage? Yes. Of course there's going to be suffering in marriage. You've got two selfish people trying to be united. Selfishness at points will emerge. Now, it's helpful for me to say, for, for, that's just helpful for me, because Tim, if someone says to me, Timothy, it's not complex. This struggle you're having with your wife right now, you're just being selfish. Now, if that comes from a loving source, and I can just say, oh, really? That's all it is? Yeah, you're just being selfish. Oh, this is the part where I'm supposed to love in spite of how I, if I feel I'm being fairly untreated. Yes, this is the time. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, 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 I have been being selfish. When before, what I was doing, I was focusing, delineating in my head all the ways she's being selfish. So marriage will reveal that about yourself. It will reveal the, bad, the, the worst parts of you. Our responses to suffering then should, again, just for review, reveal who we really are so that we can grow, mature, develop, but should also, too, 
reveal who we are so that we can be fully seen, as we said, known, understood, so we can be loved. So our vow does place us in a prison at times. I want you to catch this. But the prison door, the way I look at it is it's unlocked. Yet we stay in the prison cell because the way out is growth, development, maturity. Guess what it is? It's repentance. Now, if we're self, so self-absorbed, all we're going to be focusing on is that our sense of justice has been violated. But, but the vow, the covenant... The, the fact that we're supposed to love the way Jesus loved the church says, it's not about my, pers- my interest right now. I'm here to serve my spouse. What was Jesus thinking about when he was up on that cross? This is so wrong. This is so wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. This is, such, this is murder. This is injustice. This is, is that what Jesus is thinking? He's thinking, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's what marriage will call you to because it's going to put you in a heated situation. The only way out, the only way out of the prison cell because it is unlocked is a a door through which you don't want to walk. You don't want to go through it. Like There's got to be another way out of this prison cell besides that. Anything else besides that because that would require humility. That would require me taking responsibility. That would require me having to confess that I've been selfish or or whatever. That would require me taking the responsibility for my part in it. But outside, the unlocked door is just like, it's like you're looking at, you're stuck in prison. I'm thinking about Alcatraz. If you ever visit Alcatraz, you look out the the prison cell, uh, there's windows where you can actually see the, the beautiful city of San Francisco. And you imagine you're in this prison cell, and outside the, the prison window, you see the vision of paradise, the heavenly city. So what is marriage doing there? The reason why I say that is because marriage will hopefully, in its revealing of who you really are and your character, will reveal the selfish parts of you, the, the worst parts of you, so you can grow, so you can repent, because repentance is the way out of the prison into the heavenly city. Now, imagine God doesn't call us to repentance. He says, you know what? You can come to heaven without any repentance. You can stay in your sin. Just come as you are and stay that way. That's okay. I died on the cross for it. What does paradise turn into? Turns into hell. Hell on earth. Again, right? We did that one time already. Right? Because earth started out as paradise. That's what Eden means. Paradise. So, I, I, in, in that, I see that God gives us, just one thing he gives, he gives us the Christian life. And he doesn't just take us home immediately, but he gives us also marriage and gives us the church because he wants to develop something in us. He wants to, he's calling us to repentance. And he, he, he says, one of the things he says is, you know what? You're going to have to be attached to deeply other people. Because whether it's a marriage or in a church, the people will end up seeing the worst parts of you. They're going to see your failures or when you flake or when you, you lose it and you, you lost it. We're going to see the worst parts of each other. And guess what? It's an opportunity to grow. It's not an opportunity to reject. Now, there are times when we're called to reject. In, in a way, like we just, look, for instance, we just read those two verses on divorce. I've seen people who experience infidelity, adultery in their marriage, and as a result of one spouse being able to forgive, this is like supernatural forgiveness, the marriage ended up becoming, became stronger than ever. So it's, it, it's not an absolute, even in extreme situations like that. But not everybody's able to, to do that. So it, can we just look at marriage this way? In order to enter paradise, in order to become a citizen of the heavenly city, you must have the identity of a citizen. You must be beautiful. You must be cleansed. And this is necessary because we have already, as I said, turned paradise into hell, and we do it again. And this is why repentance is the only way in. Okay, and I'm, I'm doing this for sake of discussion and just teaching because we know Jesus is the way in. But what does Jesus call us to? Repent and believe. Is that because he wants, you know, he hates everything about us? No, because he wants to do something. He wants to bring us back to the beauty for which we were designed. 
So he's, he's preparing us to be citizens. Now, like, there's the thief on the cross who died, and Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise, okay? So I'm not trying to say you better uh, become a certain level of holiness before God will let you in. But, so we have kind of both things happening, because we have a verse in, in, in Hebrews that says, without holiness, no one's going to see the Lord. No one's going to see the Lord. We have verses like, uh, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we done all these wonderful works in your name? Preach the kingdom, cast out devils, heal people of diseases. Then he'll profess unto them, depart from me. I never knew you. And we could argue that that word know is like the relationship, the intimate relationship of Christ and his bride. So, so we, so we want to take all of scripture into account. So I say all that to say this. God has a purpose even now in our marriage and in our Christian life. He wants to develop beauty in us. He's not just trying to make us miserable by taking away all this, our favorite sins. He wants to make you beautiful because you're made in his image and he is beauty. All the beauty that we ever experience is ultimately derived and find its, finds its source in God. So if that's who he is, can, can't you see how uh, he would want to make everything beautiful? And he does that through the cross. So here's the thing about Jesus. Well, I'm getting there in preparation for communion. Here's a text that I think is really relevant to marriage that kind of points out what we're saying. I, and again, this may shape, I want this to, if it needs to, change your view on what marriage is and what its point is. Luke 9, 57 says this. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, hey, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, hey, foxes have dens to live in, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. He said to another person, hey, come follow me. The man agreed, but he said, hey, Lord, first let me return home, bury my father. But Jesus told him, hey, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, here it is, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Now, if your understanding of who Jesus is doesn't know what to do with that statement of Jesus, then your understanding of who Jesus is needs to change. And mine does too. So put your hand to the plow, I think is such a perfect way of saying what Jesus is calling us to. When we finally put our hand to the plow, we will, guess what's going to happen? We're going to encounter stones, hard ground. We're going to get blisters on our hands. But this is all necessary to what? Reap the harvest. This is what marriage is going to do. If you think you'll find happiness someplace else, then you cut yourself off from God who is, the, who is only calling you to the process of becoming a citizen fit for paradise, but you can still seek to create an imitation paradise outside of God. You think something else is going to bring you more satisfaction, more joy. You say, you know what? I don't like God's vision for marriage. I'm going to replace his vision uh, in, in purpose for marriage for something else. He's calling us to something infinitely greater, but our deception says our vision is more beautiful than his. So we put our hand to the plow when we get married. We encounter stones and hard ground and blisters. But if you keep your hand on the plow, you will emerge a cleansed citizen of paradise. There's a cleansing process that God wants to accomplish through the marriage. But a lot of times, what, what do we want to do? We just want to eject. As soon as it gets hard, we just want to eject. So if we can stop and say, you know what? It's okay. Marriage was meant to reveal the parts that need work. So let's let the Holy Spirit do his work. It doesn't mean God is going about ready to reject me. It, he's calling me to something beautiful. So I don't have to get all defensive about it and feel like I'm going to be rejected and, and no one wants me and let it affect my sense of self-worth and have a pity party for myself. I can say, hey, you know what? This is an opportunity for God to do something beautiful. So let's do the work and figure out why this is happening. Why do I respond this way? What, what am I looking for in the situation of the person to fill my soul in a way that only God can? Put your hand to the plow. Don't look back. Let the process do its good work. 
So that's why I think Luke 9, it, it lists people who use good things as excuses through which Jesus sees. Excuses and distractions keep us from fulfilling our vow to another and keeps us from becoming the citizen of paradise we're called to be. But the, the hardships when we face them are the necessary preparation for paradise because the result is we enter into his glorious presence without spot, blemish, or a single fault. So that's what, God, that's what Ephesians 5 tells us that God is accomplishing in us through this revealing process so that he ends up in the end presents us without a single fault. So in the... So I, Going back to the question now, is that piece of paper oppressive? Or is it calling us to the place where we can be the most free? Is it, is it setting us up to grow into a beautiful person? Is it bringing us to the place where we can be deeply loved? Is it oppressive? Or is something way bigger happening? Because the idea is, if you do eject out of the marriage, you don't think you're going to bring those same problems with you to the next one? And say, well, but this new person I'm dating, is, it's such a thrill. The thrill fades. The infatuation fades. It's meant to. Because it's to grow into something deeper. So here's, here's where the book puts these two things together. He says, to be loved but not known is comforting, but it's superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. Rejection. But to be fully known and truly loved is a lot like being loved by God. Do you see all this? Marriage is meant to illustrate how what God already, the love he already has for us. He already knows all the worst parts about you. As we often say, the shame, all that shame, those skeletons you have locked in your closet. Like he already has VIP access to that. You may not have realized it, but he already knows all that. More than you even know it. And yet he, he loves you. He got up on a cross for you. And we say to that, glory, hallelujah. Aren't you glad that's who God is? So if you leave a person when the thrill is gone, you didn't love the person, you only valued the thrill. You see, that's what, that's what we're saying. And have you ever found that when you're in a dating relationship, you find yourself saying stuff like, I'm going to love you forever. You're the only one. Like we start, it just seems natural. Is it just me? I hope it's not just me. I... But we end up saying, like, we, we want to make these, like, our love, and then even before we get engaged, we want to give a promise ring or whatever. We want exclusivity. No one forces this upon us. And I say this because, like, at G&L, all these kids feel all this pressure to get into an exclusive relationship, say, at 11 years old. And I'm just telling them, you don't have to do that, actually. And here, let me tell you why. That's a lot of pressure, kid. <laughs> but they feel all this pressure. But I, I think part of it, now there's the social, you know, cultural environment, say their school, whatever, but I think part of it is our desire for something that which is exclusive and also a permanence, an eternality. The security and the beauty from knowing the love will never end. That it won't end in rejection. Like we'll come to a certain point and then they'll know us at a certain level where they say, I can't do this anymore, I'm out of here. And then we crash. Like we have these desires. I think we're already out of, yes, we are. Okay. So what, what's going to go on to say is there's emotion and action in marriage. Your emotion often, you won't feel like being loving. You won't feel like serving, but do it anyway. Because often when we'll do that, the emotion will follow. If we'll serve, and I think this is just what Jesus says when he says, where... Um, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The love follows on the back, back end. So, we, we, so marriage cannot be a place where we wait and say, I'm going to love this person when I feel like it. it that's not going to work. How often are you going to feel like it? And, and to me, masculinity is saying, and this is the, this is the standard I put on myself because I want to grow, is saying, I want to love my wife the best and the most even when I it's the time when I least feel like it or least feel like she deserves it. I want to be that person because that person looks a lot like Jesus who got up on a cross for people who are in the process of murdering him. I want that. 
And Jesus is willing to give it to me. So I like what John 12, 24 says, unless you let something die, a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But, if, but its death will produce many new kernels. And I think in a plentiful har- harvest, th- those who love their life in this world, it goes on to say, will lose it. Those who care nothing for this, their life in this in this world, we'll keep it for eternity. And I think sometimes our, we need to let a certain view of marriage die and replace it with something that's actually capable of producing fruit, something that's capable of giving us uh, true life, abundant life, not only now, but for eternity. First John four nineteen says, we love each other because he first loved us. You think about the implications there. We, we're channeling his love into love, being able to love people that are, including our spouse, that are not lovely in the moment. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And here's what I want to conclude with. Jesus, here's, here's the point about Jesus. It was so amazing. Jesus, through love and action, the cross, makes us lovely. He didn't wait for us to become lovely or lovable. He makes us that way. I want to be like that. Because it's transformative. When we'll love the unlovely, it's transformative to help them become lovely. So I got to replace, I, that's what I want in my life, and I got to get rid of the idea of if, if my wife withholds from me, or if someone withholds from me, I withhold from them. Now there's times where it is very appropriate to withhold, dangerous situations, whatever. I'm, sure. But I want to be like Jesus, and I want to think through that in real time. So we sometimes got to let our immature understanding of love die if our love is to rise again and cause others to live and be loved. So what we're celebrating, we're going to transition out to the Lord's table. What we're, what we're celebrating is today specifically, particularly, is the way that Jesus loves his bride. And I want to say it, what I've already said by way of conclusion, in the midst of agony and betrayal, Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And this is the way we must learn to love. So I, here's what I want us to do when we take communion. You know, we sit, I want us to have a little time of introspection. And we, we get the elements. We go back to our, our chair. I just want us to do a little inventory and say, hey, is there, is there places where I've been self-centered where it's actually, I need to recalibrate and see it as an opportunity for me to, to be more like Jesus in love? And also, let's recommit to love our Lord who is worthy. We have a tendency to drift, don't we? Plateau, be distracted. Can we use this time of communion this, this morning to recommit our dedication to the Lord who's been nothing but faithful and dedicated to us. Can we focus on that this morning? Did I get an amen out there? Okay, yes. Thank you for the amen. That was great. We don't get those uh, too much, but that was good. So let's recommit. Let's do inventory. And by that, we're going to declare to the forces of darkness that he is worthy. And sorry about your luck, forces of darkness, but he's making us worthy. And that's what we're celebrating this morning. He's made us worthy, he's making us worthy, and we will be worthy. It's past, present, future tense involved in the gospel. So, I want to invite you in the front row, all the disciples of Jesus, to come forward. And you say, maybe, ah, that's too hard. Christianity is hard. Well, yeah, put your hand to the plow. Don't look back. It's hard. But it's, it's amazing. God's going to empower you to do it. You think, I can't do that. Yes, you can with the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you see the necessity of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, don't try to do it alone. It's going to be, huh, won't end well. All right, De- uh, Maestro, if you'll play the music as we, we come forward. I want to invite everyone. Now don't be shy.
Further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and his wife must respect her husband. Let's pray together. Father, we, we thank you for your love for us. Jesus, we thank you for getting up on a cross for us to pay the penalty for our sin, but then also showing us what self-sacrificial love looks like. Lord, for the men, I pray you would empower them to love their wife the way that Jesus loves the church, the way he gave up his life for her, for us. Father, I I pray for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to this end. Lord, I pray for wisdom and discernment in in learning how to live out all that you're commanding us to in this passage. Lord, and lastly, we just praise you that you, you have been keeping your word to never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, lastly, for those who who maybe stand uh, at a distance, maybe feel like a spectator, Lord, I pray that you would cause them by your Holy Spirit to encounter and uh, experience your deep love. That their hearts would be filled up with this encounter with the one true and living God. Lord, they would come to know you, have a personal relationship with you they would immediately result in their having a strong desire to repent because they have believed, because you have given them that which is necessary to believe. Lord, I pray you do that great supernatural new birth, regenerative work for anyone here that does not yet know you, for anyone watching who may not yet know you. Lord, we praise you, we worship you for the love for the forgiveness, for the healing that you've provided. Lord, we, we long to be in your presence. And we say, lastly, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, you are dismissed uh, to fellowship. And we will see you next time or hopefully this Wednesday. <laughs>